What is this and what could be happening? It's an enormous cloud of gas and dust, mostly hydrogen. It's a stellar nursery in the constellation of Orion, where massive amounts of hydrogen are collapsing to form stars. And this is what we're going to be talking about today, the life cycle of stars. Here are some sentences. They're in your Word document. You're going to put them in the right order. See if you can describe the process that leads from that dust cloud into a solar system. So here's a picture of our sun viewed with invisible light, but with a massive filter. Never look at the sun directly, it will destroy your retina. We can see solar storms on it, we can see a lot of activity there. But what powers the sun? What is the sun made from? And why does it glow? Why does it give off heat and light? Why does it produce all that energy? This is what we're going to be looking at in this presentation. We're going to be looking at how that energy is, is um, transferred, how we can calculate how much energy there is, and why the process happens and how it relates to the life cycle of stars. So here's a few concepts first. The concept of isotopes. Now we all know about atoms, and we all know that about elements, and that there are all the elements on the periodic table, and they have protons and neutrons and electrons. And here we're just talking about protons and neutrons. So at the bottom there, you can see H for hydrogen. There's a red one, a purple one, and a green one. Can you see what is different about those elements? They're all hydrogen, so they all have one proton. But why are the numbers different? The answer is that they've got neutrons. Hydrogen doesn't normally have any neutrons. It just has a proton and an electron. So the red one has one proton and just has a proton. So the bottom number is a proton number, which is one, the atomic number. And the top number, in this case, is the relative atomic mass, which is also one, because it's just got one proton and nothing else. The top number, in this case, is what the atom has in its nucleus. So we call it the nucleon number, or um, the relative atomic mass, and it is one, because it's only got one proton. And don't be thinking that it's always the number on top and always the number on the bottom. On some periodic tables, they're side by side. On some periodic tables, they're the other way around. But it's usually the biggest number is the mass number, because that's the number of protons and neutrons. We did this this year as well. Look at the purple one. That one has one proton, obviously, because it's hydrogen, but it has one neutron as well. So the top number, which is the relative atomic mass, is two and the one in green has three so this is what is really going on the one the red one is called proteum that's a, an isotope of hydrogen so the word isotope means type means a version and it's all to do with different numbers of neutrons so proteum doesn't have any neutrons that's the normal hydrogen that we normally talk about deuterium though is heavy hydrogen and it has one neutron so it still behaves like hydrogen you could make water out of it, H2O, except it will be heavy water because it's each hydrogen has got an extra neutron which has a mass. So we call it heavy, heavy hydrogen and it would make heavy water. Deuterium is that one there. The one on the right, which I've called a green in its symbol, is tritium. You can see that jute means two and trit means three. So tritium has three nucleons, one proton because it's hydrogen, but two neutrons, very heavy hydrogen. And these, these um, isotopes occur naturally, or they can be made in nuclear reactors. But, we're, but they do exist, but there's obviously a lot more protein than deuterium and tritium. But any collection of hydrogen, you're going to get a little bit of the others. A star is made of hydrogen, so it's made of all these different isotopes of hydrogen, protium, deuterium and tritium. Now, when those isotopes get close together, something interesting happens. So if we've got some tritium and we've got some deuterium and they come together, we're talking about protons and neutrons, remember, not electrons here. If you bring two protons together or three pro any number of protons together, they're going to repel because of the electromagnetic force. They're, protons are positively charged, so a positive is going to re repel a positive. So you can't get a proton and other protons to, to go and hang out together. They're just going to repel. 
But if you've got enough pressure to squash them together and you've got a massive amount of temperature, temperature and pressure, then you could squash them together. You have some tritium, some deuterium, and you could push them and squash them together. And if you did that, they would fuse together. That's where the name nuclear fusion comes from. They, jo they would join together, squish together. And the reason that works is that when you get protons close enough together, so they're almost touching, another force of nature takes over that only works at that close range, and it's called the strong nuclear force. Great obvious title. So the strong force takes over. It's much stronger than the electromagnetic force the re that would repel positive and a positive, and they stick together. And if you've got those two protons and two neutrons, add them together, you get what you can see there. Helium, two protons, two neutrons. That's normal helium. So two hydrogens squashed together will make helium. And there's a leftover neutron that flies off. But we don't just get helium given off in nuclear fusion. A massive amount of energy is given out. This is the energy of the sun. This is far more energy than we get from burning any fossil fuels. Far more energy we get even from nuclear fission, which happens in nuclear power plants around the world and in nuclear bombs. Nuclear fusion, which powers every sun, gives an enormous amount of energy by joining together those two hydrogens to make a helium and a leftover neutron. A massive amount of energy is given out. And a sun will continue to join together all its hydrogen into helium until there's no hydrogen left. And then you've got a star made of helium. And that star um, will become a red giant. And it will grow to a much larger size than it started out. And it will start to try to fuse helium together. And if it got two heliums and squashed them together, it would make the next element up on the periodic table, which is beryllium. So we can make more elements in stars. This is where elements are made, but not all of them. Only up to about iron is made in this way by fusing in the center in the core of a star. And what's this? This is a picture of the Crab Nebula. It's a massive cloud of dust and gas, just like we saw at the start, except this is a star that has exploded. We're seeing there the guts of a star, an explosion that is going on now, a massive, massive explosion. And what we can see there is all the innards of that star, which has got hydrogen, helium, beryllium, iron, all sorts of carbon, oxygen, all sorts of elements, all the way up to iron, are in that star. And spewed out into the universe to then turn into other stars or other other planets. Every element in your body, in all the all the carbon, all the hydrogen, all the oxygen, that was all came from the center of some star that exploded. We are made of stardust. But where did our gold come from? Where did uranium come from? Where did the heli heavier elements come from? They came from a star too, but a massive star a massive star that underwent an enormous supernova. So an ordinary explosion, that wouldn't, an ordinary supernova wouldn't make very heavy elements, but a super giant supernova would. So when these atoms collide, they give off energy. But how much energy? Can we work it out? And we can, thanks to Einstein. The most famous equation in the world, I'm sure you've heard of it, E for energy, E equals mc squared, where E is energy, m is the mass of the stuff that you've got, c is the speed of light. So what this really means is quite profound, that the actual mass of these atoms is turned into energy. So some of the matter itself is turned into energy. So mass can equal energy and energy can equal mass. To put it another way, you could say that energy is speeded up matter and that matter is slowed down energy which is, gets quite philosophical and weird i've got a question for you it's quite a straightforward one but it looks weird because of the numbers but it isn't but you need a calculator if you work out um, that sum you'll be able to work out how much of that mass has been lost how much has been turned into energy using that famous equation see if you can figure it out only one question See if you can figure it out it's in the document. 
And as you can see, uh, very small amounts of hydrogen, and you'll find out, give a massive amount of energy. So could we do this ourselves? It would certainly solve our energy problems. We can do it, but there's still not a working version of it. That could be a power station, although we're working on it. This is an interesting story. You'll see the link in the Word document. This is a few years ago. This guy at school did fusion in his physics lab. The story is in the Word document. Have a look at it. There was a problem with it, which is why we're not making fusion reactors um, into replace oil and gas and nuclear fission right now. But we're trying on it. This is the main project, the, I, the ITER project in France, and it's being built right now. If it works, our energy problems are over. So your penultimate question is about this. Have a look at the link for the um, ITER project and answer this question. What would happen if fusion, nuclear fusion, uh, was possible? Things would change quite dramatically, but what? Have a look at the videos and come up with your little report on how the world would change if we replaced all our power stations with nuclear fusion. Finally, let's look at the life cycle of stars. That's how we began. So we began with a stellar nebula, which becomes a star like our sun, fusing together hydrogen. And that's what the sun is doing now. And it's been doing it for, what is it, um, four and a half billion years about halfway through its life. So in another four and a half billion years, it'll run out of hydrogen. All the hydrogen will have been turned into helium. Then it will become a red giant and it will grow in size, turn a bit red, grow in size and swallow up all the inner planets, including the Earth, and become massive. And it will be fusing helium together to make beryllium. It'll do that for a certain amount of time, but then it won't have enough energy to do it anymore. It will lose that temperature and pressure and it'll, quite in a quite boring way, um, shed its outer outer layers and become a white dwarf and glow for a bit and then become a brown dwarf. So the sun has a sort of um, quite sad ending really. But what if it wasn't an average but what if it wasn't an average star? It was a massive star like Betelgeuse, top left hand corner of Orion. It's fantastically large star and if you saw the video from last week uh, the week before last you would have seen um, those star size comparisons now when Betelgeuse um, ran out of hydrogen which it did a while ago it was fusing helium and it became a red supergiant and that's what it is today it's a massive red supergiant star but it's dimming and that's a sign that something's going to happen but because this is a massive star, it won't just shed its layers and die. It will explode as the energy produced in it is so massive, bigger than the gravitational pull of, it, of its um, mass. It will explode into what we call a supernova and it will shed most of its matter out into, into space, just like the, we saw with the Crab Nebula picture. And the mass that remains won't have any explosive power so it will collapse under its own gravity and shrink and shrink and squash and shrink and all the um all the electrons all the protons that are nearby will be squashed together to make neutrons and it will become a neutron star a star made of just neutrons if you get an electron and a, and a proton you squash them together it's a positive and a minus remember it becomes a neutron that's what a neutron is so a neutron star very very dense quite small but incredibly heavy and spinning very fast with little glowing bits on it in that little picture there it might spins around like a little lighthouse with parts of it glowing parts of it not glowing if the star is even bigger it might keep shrinking it might keep squashing it doesn't just become a neutron star it squashes down in under intense gravity and becomes what we call a black hole something that's so heavy so dense that it pulls in everything around it. Not only matter, but also light. Even light can't escape it and get sucked in. And we call that a black hole. And that's the subject of next week's presentation. So there's a summary of the life cycle of a star, an average star or a massive star and their fates.